briefly go through in a little case study, um, which gives a little bit of a glimpse of um, a situation which we've applied uh, PMCMC for together with dynamic modeling. Um, and uh, while um, really still in its early stages, it'll give some sense of motivations, um, how we can use these techniques, and including how we can use them with uh, different sources of data. Um, so uh, I think for most people in the room, probably everyone in the room, I don't need to spend uh, too much time um, uh, going into the tremendous burden uh, in terms of health, uh, loss of life, um, uh, quality of life, uh, family, um, uh, family distress, uh, and cost caused by the um, opioid epidemic in North America, centered on the U.S., but also affecting Canada. Uh, drug overdoses um, have led to a, a terrible toll in Canada, particularly in, um, in British Columbia and uh, and uh, some other provinces in the U.S. Uh, with very high tolls. Uh, I know particularly in the Midwest as well as um, some Western cities such as uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, uh, the, the continued burden of this, ep uh, this epidemic suggests that existing <coughs> strategies, while they have made some dent in, in, on the, um, the burden imposed, uh, they've fallen short of, of really uh, solving the problem in any deep way. Um, and responsive to the tangled, com technically complex nature of this epidemic, um, the dynamically complex features, system dynamics models, as well as other types of modeling, including agent-based models, have become popular in addressing um, policy questions within the spheres. Um, and um, some some of these contributions, including those from Stanford University, have um, been made in the pages of uh, very prominent journals uh, with much interest in examining trade-offs between policies. One of the challenges here, though, is that in this sphere, the nature of the situation is evolving so quickly in terms of substances involved in terms of uh, procurement mechanisms, um, in terms of uh, responses to the outbreak, et cetera, um, um, social norms, that there's um, a real risk when we build models in this area of rapid obsolescence. There's also marked data gaps in this area, reflective of the fact that much opioid abuse is almost by definition illegal and people don't want to share data you know um, uh, if their behavior can be interpreted crimin criminally and there's a lot of uh, elements of what's going on whether it's mail order drug supplies or elements of dealer uh, obtaining drugs through dealers etc that is hidden and where the parties involved want it to remain hidden and thwart uh, easy data collection. Um, at the same time, um, the rapid evolution of this epidemic makes rapid learning very, very important. This prizes strategies which don't merely put in place a model and then just use it, but which keep that model in a state that it can be uh, updated on an ongoing basis. And as we've seen during this boot camp, Machine learning algorithms have made it easier in recent years using techniques such as we've covered here to incorporate empirical data into dynamic models, helping these models to learn over time. Um, so the objective of this study, this was actually undertaken in response to a data challenge from uh, one of my favorite conferences, um, SBP, um, Sociobehavioral Prediction and Modeling, um, which is a wonderful conference bringing together communities of health scientists, behavioral scientists, uh, computer scientists, uh, and others from a industrial engineers from, including from um, uh, system science and data science backgrounds. I circulate widely at that conference and have been an organizer for a number of years. 
And this, this particular study took place as in a response to a grand challenge problem uh, within that, uh, uh, that uh, the context of, of uh, um, you know, a challenge for participants to submit strategies for dealing with making sense of available data on opioid abuse. So we saw it in this contribution, modest though it is, to provide a framework to inform policy discourse uh, with respect to opioid abuse. Um, and we did so recognizing that we have, we, we are fortunate to be in a position of having recourse to many experts in this area. Um, some of them actually met with us over lunch. I don't know if uh, people realize there was a, a vigorous conversation going on on our table on, um, on virtual reality and, um, and uh, uh, bungee jumping. Um, uh, and. Uh, and one of the participants was uh, one of our prime contacts at Corrections and Policing, who um, is an uh, important, um, important source of, of uh, provider of data for, from, uh, from Corrections and Policing and also indirectly from social services. We have um, the ear of um, one of the foremost leaders here in the province. Um, uh, in terms of providing uh, very kindly his advice on addictions medicine front, and a wide variety of others who have helped shape our understanding within the opioid area. And based on that understanding, we worked to build a model that would capture a lot of their understanding, but also be responsive to the need of a model that can stay updated with respect to um, new data that comes out in a changing situation. So the goals here addressed in many of the features I've just listed. There's market data gaps uh, because of, for example, illegal trade and um, so much of the burden that goes on in the community is, is understudied. Um, so we sought to apply a model that would help us estimate poorly understood and measured areas of the system. In other words, latent areas of the system. Um, and that would integrate a wide variety of empirical data. It would give that sort of, um, I analogize it in the first day to a um, to a, uh, you know, t uh, like a, a CAT scan, a CT scan, which could integrate data from many angles and give a 3D picture of what's going on um, in terms of the uh, external system. Given the rapidly changing nature of the ep uh, opioid epidemic, we want a model that can learn from and adapt to data in which stays current with the latest evidence. Um, not only in terms of parameterizing it, but in terms of capturing shifts that might, for example, notably change uh, parameter values of the model. Um, and we sought to use high velocity data sources to inform this rapid learning. In order to anticipate coming trends, we sought a dynamic model that could project forward from the current state and to evaluate policy scenarios that models should be able to ask what if questions. So we ended up um, going through many iterations with this model and uh, uh, so Yen is, is one of the key people behind it, but Bryce also contributed as did a number of, of others uh, within our group. Um, and uh, the model uh, was then um, uh, a, a larger construct. We ended up, through a lot of thinking and discussion, we ended up um, boiling it down into uh, two different pieces. Um, uh, we had um, sort of broadly captured uh, areas of the model focused on individuals who, are, who, are, who, who lack current uh, disorder. Um, there's a chain here associated with uh, chronic pain treatment, uh, which is a major pathway in Saskatchewan and uh, in the US, uh, which was the po point of our focus on uh, Cincinnati, Ohio towards uh, exposure to opioids and in fact uh, to getting a person to the point where they are physically dependent on opioids. And then there was um, uh, a set of stocks associated with disordered population, whether through prescription mechanisms or through uh, sourcing from dealers uh, up here by which people uh, become disordered. And disordered in the sense that um, they can't live a fully functional life because of the, their level of dependence on opioids. There were also past disordered users who were uh, now clean but could fall back into um, 
uh, into uh, use again. Um, beyond this, we sought to um, subscript this model by several factors. These include uh, opioid tolerance level. This is a key factor involving risks of opioids. The idea here is that taking opioids for long periods of time, let's say through chronic pain pathways, might lead an individual uh, to develop uh, physiological dependence on opioids. Um, uh, and a lot of the way that works is uh, they uh, develop a higher, as it's called, tolerance level. So they need to achieve the same physiological effect a larger amount of that opioid uh, dose. And so they become more and more um, in need of higher doses. And a lot of what you see in chronic pain prescription pathways um, involves escalating the dose um, to deal with this growing tolerance level. Now, that's not merely a curious fact of the situation. It has to do with some of the biggest risks because individuals who develop high tolerance come to depend on taking um, uh, high doses of opioids. And if at some point their supply is interrupted, for example, if they are discovered by the system to be disordered or discovered by the system to be confabulating pain, to make up pain, or otherwise to, um, to be gaming the system, like going to two separate doctors at once, um, they can be cut off from their supply. Now, their body has a high need for continued supply of opioids. And often those individuals who are cut off or find themselves unable to continue with their prescriptions turn to dealers. And they turn to dealers in a way that puts them at high risk for two reasons. One of, well, at least two reasons, probably, uh, there's actually a number more, but two big ones I'll emphasize now. One, the dealers, um, the dealer supplies of opioids are often far less well controlled. And so dealers may be cooking up batches of pills on their home stove, and there's different levels of concentration of the drugs at different levels of this you know, pressure cooker that's cooking it. Um, and they scoop it out and turn pills. And so who knows what you're going to get in terms of dose. But the second thing is, when these individuals who were disordered stop taking and start taking drugs from the street, often it's catch as catch can. They can't plan on it every day. It goes sometimes a while before they can get a new dose. And during the time between doses, their, their tolerance level will wane. The tolerance level, the amount they can take to get the same physiological effect drops. But they're often unaware of this. So they think that they want to take, a, for example, a larger amount if they get pills that are pharmaceutical pills. Um, but in fact, because their tolerance has waned, it's a dynamic phenomenon. It, it, it goes down over time. They feel great craving. They want the drug, but if they can't get it, it continues to wane. And if they get hit by a drug similar dose to what they were taking earlier under very controlled con conditions, or if they get a dose that's who knows what it is from a dealer's pressure cooker from some drug lab, they, they can be killed because they don't have the tolerance to accept it anymore. Um, by contrast, dealers who are kept in prescription, and this goes on in Canada, particularly in British Columbia, for example, who are treated uh, with opioids over time, um, either uh, things like methadone or, or even injection heroin, sometimes individuals can be on these uh, on a prescription basis for prolonged times and actually lead fairly functional lives if it's very, very well controlled. But there are high risks associated with the dealer supplied population uh, precisely because of tolerance dynamics, or, or that's one of the big reasons. Also, chronic pain status is another factor that uh, affects in a big way a person's uh, pathways by which they encounter opioids and can continue to get them, and then disorder history. Um, the degree to which they've had a previous disorder which can put them at high risk of relapsing. Okay, we've talked enough about particle filters. I want to talk about how 
data related to this model without going into too much details because we have a lot to cover this afternoon. So this is a model that includes quite a few stocks, especially once you consider those subscripts. You can imagine a particular stock here being associated with tolerance that builds up or that decays over time, such as here, if they're clean. Um, so one, one type of data that we had was online search behavior. So we made use, somewhat inspired by that little model, plot piece model, that we saw earlier involving uh, search data for, um, uh, for, for H1M1 influenza. Um, we looked at Google trend data related to different factors that might clue us in into interest or dynamics associated with different pathways. These include uh, protective measures like naloxone, but also measures related to uh, chronic pain, drug rehab. This is a very under evidenced area because a lot of drug rehab in the states even and in Canada too the truth is is private it's through private clinics where even those states which have extensive um, uh, databases to study opioid abuse they don't have really good data on rehab rates or or detox rates and finally dark web activity so the dark web was a um, source of of drug, uh, obtaining drugs for many users. And individuals could find on the dark web uh, sites um, akin to the Silk Road site, which was set down at some point, where they could find drug markets and they could order drugs online. And dark web what is a, an area of the web that is accessed through um, secure channels and mechanisms using mechanisms like Tor, the onion router, which basically obscure people's identities. So it's designed for people to be able to go to certain sites that are obscured so they can't be shut down easily. They go there in a way that's anonymized so that police can't easily find who they are. Um, they can't easily track them. They kind of jump to multiple machines that end them up there. and and then they can purchase, uh, uh, purchase drugs on those sites. We sought to understand the level of interest or use of dark web uh, over time. Um, we also had some more traditional types of data. Hamilton County, which is the county around Cincinnati, which was our focal point by terms of the, of the challenge, the SBP challenge, had drug overdose deaths. These are reported by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US. We also had opioid prescription um, uh, reports from that same county. We had reports from EMS, from uh, emergency medical services. So these are paramedics um, uh, to responding to drug-related activities. Um, I believe these explicitly included naloxone delivery or heroin-related. They, they, would, they would indicate that it was heroin-related, um, for example, drug type of traffic. And then police calls, we had information on those. On a daily basis, geostamped, which was handy. Um, and uh, these were some of the major data sets. The arrows don't really show where these link to, but the point is that as is the case with particle filtering or particle MCMC, you look for all of these to have analogs in the model. So given for a given data source, you try to align it with a likelihood function to say where might we expect from the model certain types of data that we could then match with police calls or with prescription counts and you end up um, saying for example well these are um, prescription people under current prescription and so we'll analogize that to to these prescription records that Ohio State state can provide to us for this county. Okay. So each of these had some linkages to one or more places in the model. Often for some of them you'll have sums of stocks or sums of flows, sort of like we saw yesterday. Um, okay, so we have likelihood functions and we made use of, of uh, some negative binomial, I think maybe some others as well. Um, we, this was a little challenge problem, so we sought to examine several scenarios 
as time allowed. Um, poor Xiaoyan was sleeping in the lab for the later parts of this project, um, so she could she could try to finish it. And um, I'm very proud of what we accomplished in the short period of time. So uh, we ended up doing some projection. We ended up looking at some point of proof of concept uh, policies and kind of model assessment and and uh, calibration of sorts through PMCMC. And I won't go into it in, uh, in detail, but uh, fundamentally, um, we took that model here in light of some of the data, and some of the data we had, we related to parameters directly, but others were more emergent behavior that we sought to match with model predictions, okay? So these were, for example, overdose counts as expected by the models shown in this kind of distribution. And these were empirical overdose counts here, shown in these kind of uh, uh, black, uh, black lines over time. And what we were capturing in the underlying model, I didn't have time to, to talk about it in detail, but we had, we had representations of the fact that um, Overdose, uh, overdose risks could vary over time due to, say, introduction of a new drug. This particular spike, I think, was due to fentanyl being introduced. In the Canadian context, I know that um, uh, that tampered or, or um, what's the right word for it? Um, uh, basically, uh, there are these adulterated drugs that are put out there. It'll say, you know, that this is ecstasy or something, and it turns out to be fentanyl well, mixed in with ecstasy or something. Um, maybe because of sloppiness and you know, cooking things up on the stove, maybe because of deliberate, um, uh, deliberate you know, attempts to, to um, get people hooked on additional substances or whatever. But the point is, the model was able to capture variations over time in the expectation for overdose counts. Uh, drug activity as well, there was a spike of drug activity associated with this sourcing. Sometimes it didn't mass well, like, like this fraction of the population under opioid prescription. We ended up doing quite a bit better from this, as I recall, in later runs. But you can see in this particular uh, run that I created for a conference presentation early on, it, it sort of runs afoul of this trend. We, we really needed something which matched better. We later got some of it. These are um, monthly opioid-related deaths. They include uh, overdoses, but also I think uh, some, some other deaths included as well, hence the different shape of the different distribution. Back pain, the model tried to sort of analogize it for the people under um, under chronic pain management, but didn't do a particularly great job. Here's drug rehab as deduced from data sources, um, and uh, this is, I think, from search data, and this is model expectation. Naloxone, also not a great job here. Dark web activity, it, it tried to match. So here we were using PMCMC to estimate a set of, um, of fixed parameters over time, like these guys. Um, and also, we were using, um, as part of PMCMC, it does particle filtering. And it tries to match this data that it sees and correct the model's stochastics with, that, um, uh, with the observed data. Um, and some of the things that we, that we computed were things that could be compared with the data. And you can see we have very, you know, we have mixed record with those. Other things were latent stocks where we don't have data about them, but this is a conjecture for what might be going on according to the model. You know, according to the best performing particles in the model, in this PMCMC context where we're also varying parameter assumptions um, over the uh, induced distribution, for example, dealer sourced with chronic pain. So here we're considering people with, um, with chronic pain and low tolerance levels purchasing from dealers, for example, um, or dealer source change rate. These are people going to dealers over time from prescription, I believe, um, people starting with dealers. Um, 
And uh, this is the hazard rate associated that it conjectures is associated with drug dealers. Um, some other stuff related to prescriptions. So the idea here was a little challenge problem, but the idea was to try to probe some of these things we can't, we don't directly measure in as much as they might be implied by model structure, empirical data, and the process of parameter estimation. These trace plots were just to develop some confidence that the model was mixing okay. Um, uh, and actually, this interesting, this illustrates one of the later better matches here, where it actually better matched that. Um, and we were projecting forward. So here we considered data to this point. So this is kind of a cross-validation strategy. We considered data to this point, and then we tried to have the model predict after that what's likely to happen. And you can see, and we sought to test, <coughs> does it match the subsequent data which was not used to inform the model? It wasn't used previously to build the model, but rather we're trying to match this and match this and match that. Um, et cetera. It didn't do as good a job here. Oh, this is intervention, I'm sorry. So this is prediction, and we're sort of testing the models in an outer sample way. Can it predict forward in a way that matches this data that's hidden and we didn't use to build the model? This is with interventions. If we put in place an intervention that resulted, for example, uh, in, I can't remember what this was, shifting people to a uh, a treatment pathway that was aimed at harm reduction, or um, an intervention, maybe the same intervention done earlier in terms of accumulated deaths, or, um, and this is what it would have been without intervention than expected. So this gives some understanding of, um, you know, when we estimated these model parameters, what did we, and in latent state, we could use it for prediction, we could use it for intervention, uh, based on these many data sources. So in terms of broad findings of this, it, it was a very early and kind of, it's still only something we shared in a kind of extended abstract way. We want to turn this into a bigger model with our partners such as Terry that we talked to over lunch, as well as many others. And we have an order in council that is supposed to be approved by the provincial legislature on, I'm supposed to hear on August 2nd or so. So that's today. Um, so, so we'll be hearing if we can get provincial data um, uh, to inform this for our province, which would be awesome. Um, we have a wide variety of partners on the health side, social services side, justice side, um, addictions medicine, uh, college of physicians and surgeons and others, um, uh, policing that we can work with. Um, and uh, I'm really hoping it, it gets approved and funded by uh, the legislature. Um, but uh, PMCMC offers, uh, it seems, based on the small project that was done, um, much of it uh, through Xiao Yan's great leadership, it offers a promising means of creating self-learning models kept current via diverse lines of uh, data. I mean, the data sources used are a little bit unusual and having a wide variety of types. I don't even think this is exhaustive, but uh, it, um, it was able to readily include them via various likelihood functions. By combining machine learning, high temporal data, this, so some of this data with daily, uh, for example, from the, uh, the search data. Dynamic modeling can allow for estimation of the latent, latent parameters um, as well as uh, as well as parameter values, uh, sorry, latent states as well as parameter values. And PMC and C-based models can project forward uh, based on understanding of latency. It allows for understanding trade-offs between interventions, and we really need to investigate early, further the potential of these methods with parallelization and, and further investigation of, of <coughs> their needs. So this is a, a, small, um, a small little example. Um, uh, that we've conducted with PMCMC, but I think it, uh, I think it uh, uh, helps, helps illustrate some of the uses of these techniques. Any questions I can answer about this before we go on to another talk? Yes? Um, what would it be the theta in that model? The, the theta. Uh, the theta. theta. Good question. Um, there were a set of, set of variables used for theta, so I'm going to um, uh, just note that 
and and I hope this is is clear to everyone, but um, uh, I'll just make it explicit in case it's not. Um, um, typically, a model like this will have many parameter values that we know with enough confidence, we think we know with enough confidence that we don't need to put them in theta. Theta is not, um, it's a little bit confusing because sometimes you hear it referred to as the parameter vector, but it's not all parameters. It's the parameters that you're seeking to sample from. Um, so whose distributions you're seeking to understand, right? Um, and here we had a couple of thetas. I think it was more than are illustrated here, but at least two of them were here. So for example, um, we, we had here uh, some parameters that related people in the chronic pain pathway as to how often they searched for pain-related terms like back pain. Um, uh, so the, the, we posited that you know someone who is suffering from chronic pain probably will sometimes have some indication of their um, concerns about that pain by virtue of search behaviors, which might be illustrated. And this search uh, behavior was for that particular region geographically. There was a similar, there was a similar um, type of uh, Google Trend. Um, uh, parameter for naloxone, which is this uh, opioid antagonist. Okay, and this was um, this was a parameter which um, uh, related. I think those who are who are at risk of an overdose in terms of their uh, searching for naloxone. But there were a set of other parameters as well that uh, I believe related to. I'm trying to remember what they are. I think there are some related to disorder. So what fraction of people um, are actually uh, in a state somewhat predisposed to disorder? This is something we heard from our addictions medicine colleagues. And particularly, it's related to childhood trauma, um, uh, especially, and, and other factors which are outside the scope of the model. So we just characterized a certain fraction of people um, as as being predisposed to it, and I think we had a parameter with respect to that, if I'm not mistaken. I I would have to go back and and go and find out what these are. But one of my students, particularly Shayam, when she gets back here, can probably do that. So the stakeholders would usually, or people that are interested in the model, would usually have a good idea of they know it's important, but they know it's not collected, and so that might indicate. Right. Oh, totally. Story. Yeah. Totally. So so this model. Although this model was a small one that we built for you know a conference challenge problem, it was small in the sense it was a, it was a focused short term effort to build this. Um, uh, the many discussions we had from stakeholders prior to this and subsequent to this um, really bring to the table certain key questions that they are interested in, which you know could serve as prioritized. Um, uh, for data collection in terms of estimation of unknown parameters. Um, they can communicate to us big unknowns that they would really like to see resolved, and we can relate them to an underlying model. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is a model uh, which illustrates in kind of general terms how that approach could be applied, but the particulars of how we use this say for Saskatchewan with particular data sources would be a bit different because of all the stakeholder feedback we've gotten. This was Cincinnati um, data and we were given we were given s some of the Cincinnati data as part of the challenge. And they basically said, here's a bunch of data on opioid related overdoses and EMS calls and police police, you know, response. Um, uh, daily, you know, or multiple times daily data, etc. And they said, go figure, like, go do whatever you want with this. But do something interesting that's policy relevant and, and either methodologically or in terms of findings demonstrate um, interesting insights. And so this is what we did in response. We, we were dealing with uh, some of the data just being given told us 
to us and told we, we need to use that, you know, in, in part of our response. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Uh, uh Since actually uh, uh, your group uh, initial uh, kind of application of this PMCMC, yeah. uh, and also just particle filtering is in a, this kind of uh, in, uh, in infectious disease, and things like this. And uh, we, you actually try to use this kind of scheme in a generic model. Yes. Right? And what, what, what problem you might think you have, or some caveats you can offer us? Great question. So I, I think what you are talking about here is, um, maybe I'm, tell me if I'm off base, but I think what you're asking is, this model, we crafted it for use with this problem, knowing that we would be using PMCMC. And that, that much is true. Um, I wouldn't say that we built too much of the model structure specifically. It's not like our plan to do PMCMC with it really in a big way affected how we modeled it in terms of the underlying stocks and flows. Except one big factor. There is one way, okay? And that is we did seek to keep the model a bit, a bit s smaller than it would have been without it because um, we couldn't afford to try to estimate a model that was absolutely um, giant. Um, so we, um, this was our first, this was, you know, a year and a quarter ago or something. It was our first attempt to use PMCMC with a um, de novo model that we, uh, that was larger and related to a, a bunch of sources of data. So we wanted to keep it a little bit smaller and so we ended up spending quite a bit of time simplifying down some pieces of it from what was originally put together. In general, if you have a model that is um, pre-existing, um, uh, you know, I'd say that it shouldn't have to be distorted a lot to be used with these techniques. At a practical level, um, it will be more challenging to use these techniques with an agent-based model or a discrete event model, um, simply because we have this template that I'll be showing you in a little bit, maybe even shortly here, um, for uh, doing this in any logic with system dynamics models. We, what we have found is we have experimented with doing this in a software package, repass to any logic with respect to agent-based models, and we have found that basically it, 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 there's no framework that offers a really good way of doing this. Um, I've talked with people who lead the repass project. Um, we've made these issues evident to the AnyLogic people. The basic deal is that those packages just don't have they're not designed to support, and they don't have the requisite flexibility to support what you need for something like particle filtering or particle MCMC of, a, of an agent-based model. So we have done it, though, despite that, by just doing more of our own building of the model. And, and that's cumbersome. It takes time. And that can take away from your ability to just do it with a stock model. But I must say with like system dynamics models, um, this can be done fairly readily if it can be represented in any logic. You can, you can put this in place fairly readily and I don't think it affects model structure that much. It shouldn't, it shouldn't require big changes in the model. Um, possible exception, size if it's a huge model, be cautious. Uh, second possible exception, um, which I have seen. I don't know if Refod is here. Um, doesn't look like it. Um, uh, so we have dealt with some models that have, shall I say, untraditional, non-traditional components um, in building them, uh, system dynamics models. And examples are conveyors 
or ovens, things that are not just normal stocks. And describing those, it turns out that those can cause some challenges when used in a particle filtering or particle MCMC context for technical reasons I won't get into. But by and large, it shouldn't require a big distortion of your model. I, I find it's pretty straightforward to put most models into this framework overall, as long as they're not, not too big. Um, so, you know, I, I think, um, I guess the other thing that's needed is you got to make sure that the model can be related to the data you observe from the world. You know, so that you need to have data from the world and you need to say the analogy for that, like where would I look for something in the model that could allow me to predict that data? And you need to identify for each data source with your likelihood function a way of asking what's the likelihood of observing this given the state of the model. That's, that's a need as well. So you need a model that, you know, is suitable for that task. Like if you have data from the world that's longitudinal in character and involves longitudinal features for different people, um, to explain that, to have a likelihood function that takes that into account, um, you will uh, need to, uh, you would need a model that had some measure of longitudinal components in it. If you don't have that, it might be hard to have a likelihood function that relates to that. So in short, you need, you need the sort of, uh, a formulation of likelihoods that's compatible with the, um, the simulation model. Is that helpful? Yeah. Other questions? Yes? Um, is there any way of, or would it be too um, specific to try and use empirical data from, say, Ethica? From? Ethica. Oh, Ethica, yeah. No, it's great. Um, it's, um, no, it's, it's excellent. Ethica is the superior. It's a superior way of. And so, and so like the ground, so truth, the ground truth model it, it is more specific to those individuals, although that subgroup that you're collecting is data on? Um, very good question. Um, so, uh, I guess it, you know my answer to that. So, Ethica is a high velocity, high variety, often high veracity, um, and yes, high volume source of data of health data. It is easily deployed, it is easily customized, it can provide um, you know, data that's very well suited to these models. In fact, our next talk, um, uh, for which the speaker has arrived, Winchell, um, involves uh, uh, using that sort of data with, with some models. And Winchell, in fact, is one of the few peoples I know worldwide who has used particle filtering and Kalman filtering, for that matter, with smartphone data. Now, to answer your question, how do you interface the data from Ethica with the model as far as characterizing, say, a subset of people for whom you have the data? If it's an agent-based model, I consider that an easier thing, because some of your agents are going to have more data on them than others and you're gonna be able to have a likelihood function that takes that into account that some agents have this detailed data, other agents don't. And just like uh, Yen's model yesterday, where she had some likelihood functions that say once a year that had age-specific data and other likelihood functions once a month that didn't have recourse to that. Um, you know, you could make use of this more detailed data for some people and not for others, and of a product of likelihoods across people or something like that. I, I could see that being quite straightforward. If you have an aggregate model and you have subset of the population on whom you have, you know, a sentinel subset on, on whom you have more accurate data, um, you know, my, my own guess is that you might argue that those that the, the situation, like the, the mean situation across the entire population is, um, it, it is uh, you know, has, has, there's a likelihood function um, relating that to what you see as kind of the average from these people, and it has a certain, um, let's say, a certain uh, 
dispersion parameter associated with it. Or maybe you stratify that model, that aggregate model, by sentinel, non-sentinel, and you have mixing between them, where one drives the other, and there you take advantage of detailed information about the sentinel group for that sentinel um, subpart, sub strat stratum, um, strat stratum of the stratified model, and the others mix with them, much as Xiaoyan. She might have data on kids. She doesn't, but you can imagine a situation where she has data on kids because of pediatric-related concerns um, that is more detailed than data on adults. And she might use one to estimate what's going on in the other. It's a so, coupled system. So it would be almost like the chicken pox and measles, where yes. you have information yes. on measles. Yes. And don't have, but, and, but that would be, say, 130 people of your ethical data, but you want to make inferences on the whole subpoxy. Precisely. You're going to drag those, that appendage around, because that's a better estimate than, 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 not, than not doing it all. Because you want information on that non-sentinel group that you don't actually, you haven't collected data. Th th that's right, but, but you know, you probably have some data on yeah, the yeah, whole population. Yeah, yeah. So it's not, it's not an inert, you know, an inert body that you're purely dragging you around. It's grounded at certain points, but not as It's grounded in, in, uh, at an infrequent level. Yeah, sure. So it might be, yeah. like, imagine if a Cheyenne's model, you had, Children, you had data every month, but adults, you had data once a year. Yeah. Not a problem. With these approaches, not a problem. You have a different likelihood function applying for month, you know, on, on a, a most months um, compared to once a year, you have a more, a, a more complex likelihood that involves the product of these couple things. And that's easily done in these. And I guess because rather than assuming that the contact rate is similar between two disease groups, you're assuming that the, the whatever linking function might not be a contact rate Correct. is equal between the central and non-central. Correct. Yeah, Correct. Right. Yeah. Correct. Um, and one of the points of thinking that you know has really influenced me is that um, I argued it on the first day, right, that sentinel groups, um, they're coupled with the people around them. Look, we're dealing with couple, highly coupled systems. My behavior in this room is coupled with yours. If I were to go leave this room for a couple hours now, you'd leave, you know. Um, uh, if, if, if you have a break, I have a break. Um, uh, you know, um, we're, we're both staying within the confines of this room. We're, you know, it, there's so many ways in which um, different individuals exhibit coupling with those around them. It's amazing. And our analysis bears this out. And Winchell's analysis can bear it out. So. Um, um, and again, formal studies of the dimensionality of the underlying system, you can see that writ large. That, you know, nominally you think each person is their own solitude, and, or, you know, each person does their own thing, and therefore to specify the system we have to specify, you know, n different possibilities for person one, n, for, n possibilities for person two that are independent of that, n for person three. They're so coupled that Knowing a bit of information about any one of them will tell you a lot about the others. You know, um, if I'm not doing, you know, vigorous calisthenics in this room, it's unlikely that you will be. Um, and you know, our, our behaviors are just so coupled that um, they're coupled in structured ways that the system ends up occupying a lot less of its space than than you anticipate. Um, and uh, I hope those are helpful comments. Yeah. Other, other questions, comments? Recognizing this as a sort of simple little thought piece example that we did for a, a conference. Questions? If anyone's interested here, um, Zuru, Xiaoyan, and Olivia there are doing quite a bit of, of particle MCMC for a number of, of different uh, conditions right now. And we're expecting by the end of the summer probably a lot more real take home kind of examples which, which are um, insightful and impactful um, within this area. Uh, this is a summer of PMCMC. Okay, so um, uh, with that, I am going to, uh, to undertake the enormous pleasure of introducing um, one of the most remarkably knowledgeable individuals that I know, um, uh, Winchell, uh, back here, who has been uh, responsible for a remarkable number of uh, 
insights, but also advances within our group. Um, uh, Winchell uh, uh, is, is remarkable for his breadth and depth of knowledge, as well as his um, uh, depth of, of sort of um, vision conceptually. He's going to be sharing with you a provocative message, um, a message that, while well, I hope it doesn't cause you to, oh, um, cause you to, uh, uh, to, to uh, be uh, 